Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the tense of Shem in our continuing study of Old Testament theology. We begin in Genesis chapter 9, verse 18. The flood has already taken place. They've come out of the ark. Everything's settled down. And we read that the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth. And then we have to add, because he's going to play a part in the story, and Ham was the father of Canaan. Now, remember that if you're reading this um, for the first time, if uh, if we imagine, for example, as Moses is the author and he is writing to the Israelites after they've come out of Egypt, remember that they're headed for the land of Canaan. So as soon as you speak of the somebody who's the father of Canaan, suddenly you've got the reader's attention because that is relevant to where they are and to where they are going. Verse 20, then Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Now, folks have come up with all sorts of theories about what's taking place here and what this means. And usually they do so without paying attention to the honor and shame culture of the ancient world, where nakedness was a shameful thing. Um, becoming drunk wasn't necessarily. Um, notice he drank of the wine, became drunk. Um, in fact, the, the The scriptures are not going to really comment on that. When we get to the New Testament, we're told, don't be drunk with wine, uh, but rather be filled with the Spirit. But that hadn't been given yet. Um, And so Noah, uh, he he drinks, he becomes drunk, he uncovers himself inside his tent. And verse 22, Ham, the father of Canaan, a reminder already, we've already been, been mentioned, had this mentioned once, but now we're, we're reminded of the connection between Ham and Canaan. Ham saw the nakedness of his father, and here's the problem. He told his two brothers outside. So instead of covering his father's nakedness, he verbally reveals it, thus bringing shame, and you have to get the, the whole honor and shame thing that was going on in the ancient world, He was bringing shame to his father's name. Verse 23, but Shem and Japheth, notice they're going to take just the opposite reaction in the honor and shame culture in which the story is being told. They uh, seek to cover their father's shame in a respectful way. They took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were turned away so that they did not see their father's nakedness. They they take great pains, great care not to look, not to expose or to see their father's shameful nakedness, and so they're, t- they're covering in a respectful way was taking place. Now, verse 24, when Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. You know, um, he somehow, uh, either he remembers or it's made known to him. Uh, We don't know how he knew, but he came to understand that. Verse 25, so he said, cursed be Canaan. Now, this brings up the first question. Ham was the one who had who had seen and who had uh, spoken and who had verbally revealed his father's nakedness, why is Canaan cursed? And all sorts of ideas have come to mind. Uh, Some Jewish rabbis said, well, Canaan must have been involved in doing something bad. Um, But the passage doesn't say that. Um, Instead, one of the things that, that I think of is that God had blessed Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, so that uh, Noah doesn't curse what God has blessed. Instead, he curses Canaan. You say, well, that doesn't seem very fair. Well, we should also remember that Canaan is going to bring a lot of cursing upon himself just based upon his descendants and the lifestyle that they they pursue. Um, I also have to mention that there, there have been times where there have been people uh, were, who as a people were cursed, and yet individuals found great blessing. In fact, one of the Canaanites that we read about later in the Old Testament is Rahab, a prostitute by the name of Rahab, who lives in Jericho. She's part of this. She's a Canaanite, so she's part of this cursed race. And yet she 
turns that cursing into blessing as she comes and embraces the Lord and his people and his Messiah. So, in any case, notice Noah says, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants. When you want to say something very strong in Hebrew, you say it twice. So, a slave of slaves. In other words, a really low slave. He shall be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord. And notice what the the Lord is called here. And when you see that word Lord in all capital letters, that's the translators telling you that's the Hebrew name for God, the the name uh, Yahweh. But notice, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. It's a title for God. He's called the God of Shem. Now, how does he become the God of Shem? Well, he, he does become the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who come from the tribe of Shem. But then the passage continues, and let Canaan be his servant. So we have a, a cursing upon Canaan, a blessing not upon Shem, but upon the God of Shem. That's what the passage says. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Of course, if your God is blessed, I suppose you're blessed too. Now in verse 27, we have a play on words. It says, may God enlarge Japheth. And I put the two Hebrew terms there, uh, the term for enlarge, uh, uh, Um so it's we could also we I guess we could translate this may God enlarge the enlarged one or may God Japheth Japheth <laughs> it's it's a play on words because the name Japheth means to be enlarged. Um, so may God enlarge Japheth and if you'll read the commentaries um, when when people ask uh, in what way was Japheth enlarged, you will find a host of suggested answers. There is no common answer. Um, They run the whole gamut. All sorts of ideas have been propounded, which is telling you (laughs) that nobody knows. And I think the reason nobody knows is because, um, notice, may God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem. How does Japheth dwell in in the tents of Shem? And again, the answer is nobody knows. The reason nobody knows is because I think they, they're asking the wrong question. You see, the right question is to ask, to whom does the pronoun refer? Who is the him? When it says, let him dwell in the tents of Shem, I don't think it's talking about Japheth. I think it's talking about the subject of the entire passage. The, enti- the subject of the entire passage isn't Japheth. It isn't Shem. It isn't Ham. It isn't Canaan. The subject of the entire passage is God. Remember, it started off, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. May God enlarge Japheth, may God Japheth and Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem. Now, how how did God dwell in the tents of Shem? And the answer, again, go back to when Genesis would have been written, assuming Moses is the author, and Moses is writing to the Israelites who have come out of Egypt, and not only are they living in tents, but God himself is living in a tent. He's living in one of the tents of Shem, because they've come out of Egypt, and God has has given them instructions to build a tabernacle into which God has come to reside so that he might tabernacle with his people. So we have a a contrast and a comparison between Adam and Noah. Remember how Adam was placed into a garden? Noah plants a garden. Adam had eaten of the fruit of the tree. Noah had drunk of the fruit of the vine. When Adam ate that fruit, it results in uh, in him recognizing his nakedness. Remember, he, he eats of the forbidden fruit, his eyes are open, and he realizes he's naked. In Noah's case, he drinks of the fruit of the vine, and as a result, he becomes naked. Now, it's inside his tent, but it results in nakedness. There, these are two nakedness stories. In the case of uh, of each one of them, the the story results in a curse. It results in a lasting division of the seed. 
and it's followed in each case by a genealogy to demonstrate the division that has taken place. So Adam, Noah, nakedness, a genealogical line, and a division between two groups. In Adam's case, his eyes were opened, and he knew that he was naked. In Noah's case, he awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done. In Adam's case, he was judged and cursed by God. In Noah's case, he's the one who places a curse, I think prophetically, upon Canaan. In Adam's case, both Adam and Eve are removed from the garden and from the presence of God. In Noah's case, the presence of God is promised to one day dwell in the tents of Shem. And of course, we already said it took place as the Israelites with Moses come out of Egypt and God comes and dwells in their midst. When we get to the tabernacle that will be erected, God himself will come and enter the building. The glory cloud will come and dwell with his people. But when we get to the New Testament, we find that Jesus became flesh, John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten Son of God. He became flesh and dwelled, and I like the way that's phrased in the Greek text of John chapter 1, verse 14. We, we could have translated that, uh, he became flesh and tented among us. He dwelled in the tents of Shem. You say, well, how is that? What kind of body did he take? He took a Jewish body. He was born of a Jewish virgin. Mary was Jewish. Jesus came unto his own and was made in Jewish flesh and lived a Jewish life and died upon a cross and rose from the dead and forever after continues to be, can I say it this way? He continues to be in the flesh. And he continues to tabernacle in that body 